We thought it'd be a good idea just to get people together in the community and uh, have a couple of our experts in the area talk to you a little bit about what's, what's actually happening and then give you a chance uh, to ask questions. What's happening is it is extremely complex and I think there's a, a fair amount of misunderstanding of different parts of it, whether it's on the part of you know, the person on the street or even members of Congress. Um, uh, a lot of, I think a lot of members of Congress don't fully understand uh, what's happening and all the details behind it. And, and it is because it's um, complex. So we're going to try at least to educate ourselves here today uh, as much as possible. Uh, two things before I start. One is that for faculty and staff who are interested in mandatory continuing legal education um, credits, uh, if you want those, as you go out, sign up with either Julian Checky or is Megan up there? There you are, over here. And uh, as you go out and you'll get the credit for it. Students don't, you don't have to worry about that until you pass the bar. So uh, the second thing is that we have put up on uh, the website a range of materials. That they're by all means not comprehensive, but they may, they address some of the issues that we're going to talk about today uh, in a little more detail and you might consult them. You can get to them by going to our current events site where this is, this event is listed and then you can uh, click on to, uh, click on to that material. Okay, the way we're going to do this is we're going to start out uh, with our panel, our group, saying uh, diff uh, they'll, they'll jo jo join in saying different things about the um, aspects of the crisis. Um, uh, let me first, though, introduce all of them. You probably should know most of them. But on the far right for you is uh, David Ruder. And David's background, among many other things, being the dean of law school as well as a longtime faculty member here, he was chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, next to him is uh, Tom Brennan, and Tom just joined the faculty this year. Uh, he uh, is, works in the finance area. Uh, he also has worked in the past at both Goldman Sachs uh, and uh, at uh, Cravath, Swain and Moore uh, in New York. Next to him is Alan Horwich. Uh, Alan has been with us for a number of years now. He teaches a range of securities related courses and also continues a, a practice at um, uh, got your firm. Schiff, Schiff Harden, Harden. Schiff Harden uh, in, that, in that area. And then last on the far left is Ken Ayot. Again, he's been with us his second year here at Northwestern. He joined us from the Columbia Business School where he was a professor in the finance department. And uh, his expertise is on both securitization and bankruptcy, which are very important to this, uh, to this issue. So let me, um, uh, let me turn it over to you now. And what, John, do you want to, do we have another slide up there? There we go. What we did is just put some of the topics up. We're not going to go through order in this. They have a prior, but these are sort of the things we'll come back to throughout the, throughout the discussion. So who's going first? David, are you going? Uh, I'm going to act as a sort of moderator and pusher here. Uh, I'm going to make a short opening statement, which is uh, this is a terrible time of crisis for us. Uh, the, uh, uh, the credit markets are in terrible problems. Uh, Congress has, uh, has defeated one bill, and there's now a Senate bill which was adopted last night will be considered by the House, I think, tomorrow. And we are uh, actually in the sense, in the center of current events today. Uh, and I think we're going to be trying to figure out what's, what has been happening, what went wrong, and uh, what the solutions might be. So uh, with that, uh, Ken, would you start us off talking about subprime mortgage orientation? Well, thank you for the invitation to present here. And when I joined Northwestern, I was looking forward at some point to talking to somebody in this hall. If it had to be nobody, I'd just talk to myself. But I'm so I'm glad you're all here. Um, it's hard to understand uh, the mortgage crisis without uh, a little bit of an understanding of what securitization is and how it contributes to uh, the developments that uh, we've been seeing. So I thought I would just give a, a brief overview of how asset securitization works, is particularly in the context of, uh, of mortgages. So the old school way that banks would finance mortgages is on their own balance sheet. You start with a bank, Citigroup, uh, Bank of America. Uh, you know, the old school method of finance is that uh, a bank would make a loan to a borrower, right, takes out a mortgage, and the bank would just hold that loan on its balance sheet until it matured, hoping that the, uh, the homeowner would make good on all its payments, and so uh, the bank would do fine. This new innovation called securitization changed uh, the landscape of mortgage finance in a very important way. Uh, the first thing uh, that goes on in a securitization is that instead of holding uh, the loans on its balance sheet, uh, 
the bank will sell them to an SPV or a special purpose vehicle. That's per, that special purpose vehicle issues mortgage-backed securities to investors right, in exchange for cash, and the cash is used to purchase the mortgages from the bank. Okay? Now, why go through all this process? Uh, the rating agencies, Standard & Poor's, uh, Moody's, Fitch, uh, they assign ratings to these mortgage-backed securities. And one of the things that they're interested in is making sure that uh, this transfer, uh, the sale of the mortgages from the bank to the SPV, uh, it creates what's called bankruptcy remoteness. That is, uh, the SPV is now the owner of the mortgages, uh, not the bank. And from the rating agency's point of view, that means they don't have to worry too much about whether the originator uh, becomes insolvent. They only have to worry about the quality of the mortgages. That's the only thing that's going to affect the value of the securities that are issued to the investors. All right? So that's one of the main reasons why this process is done. Uh, now let's just take a look at the balance sheet of a special purpose vehicle. One of the things that you may be uh, wondering about is, how is it possible that uh, a special purpose vehicle could own mortgages, in particular subprime mortgages, mortgages that uh, are made to borrowers who are very likely to default? How could it possibly be that that special purpose vehicle can issue very safe AAA rated securities? Right? Is this just turning straw into gold? And what was really going on here? And the reason that was possible um, is what's called a, a tranching process. That is, this special purpose vehicle would issue securities to investors of various levels of maturity. All right? And so, at the end of the day, we're all aware, uh, the rating agencies, investors, are all aware that some of these uh, borrowers are going to default on their mortgages and there are going to be some losses. The way these things are normally structured is that the losses kind of flow up the waterfall. That is, there's a junior or first loss piece and they bear the first group of losses from the homeowners that default. All right. The losses won't touch the senior tranche until the losses are so large that both the first loss and the junior tranche are completely wiped out. And that's the rationale. In other words, it would take a lot of defaults of these mortgages in order for the senior tranche to be affected. And that's why a special purpose vehicle can issue AAA rated safe claims despite the fact that the underlying assets may be in fact, uh, in fact, risky. Now, there's just two things I want to say before I turn it back over to the panel. Um, and it relates to this um, proposal uh, to, to buy, uh, of, of our taxpayer dollars being used to buy uh, these mortgages. Why are these things so complex? Number one, I oversimplified this issue tremendously by just having you know, three classes here. It's not uncommon for a securitization to involve 30 tranches. All right, of not only different levels of seniority, but uh, different timing of the prepayments. Some tranches involve uh, only the interest payments, some involve only the principal payments. So the securities themselves are complex. And of course, they're based on mortgages, where you need to know what the underlying mortgages are worth. To whom were the, who were the borrowers? Uh, how much equity did they put into the home? When was the mortgage originated? Who, by whom was the mortgage originated? All of these things factor into uh, the value of these securities that we're thinking about buying. And that's why you know, the, trying to price these things is so incredibly uh, complex. The second thing is, you know, what's the difference really between holding these things on the balance sheet and selling them to a special purpose vehicle? Is that uh, there's a disconnect between the origination process and the ultimate mortgages. That is, while the bank may hold, in some cases, the first loss piece, which means they have some risk in, in the game. They have some skin in the game if the mortgages default. They don't have as much as they would have had if they had held the mortgages on their balance sheet in the first place. And what a lot of people have suggested, and there's some evidence for that, is that the quality of the mortgages originated have been affected by the fact that the originator is no longer holding the risk of the mortgages that were originated. All right. So that's a brief summary of the securitization process. Let me uh, turn it back over to uh, the panel. Thanks, Ken. I'm going to ask Tom to talk about, to tell us how is it that these, uh, uh, that these securities ended up in the hands of the investment banks? And how, what was the distribution process that, 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 that how, did the, how did the investment banks get into this? Okay, yeah, so, so why did anyone buy all of this stuff? You've, you've got now these incredibly complicated instruments um, that are, uh, you know, difficult to explain even in hindsight as we, as we go through these complicated slides. And you might say, well, why did anyone buy it? Why did we start this whole process? Well, well let me try to sell it to you from, from the good point of view. What, what people said is homeowners need to be able to buy homes and, you know, money needs to get to those homeowners. 
And there's a whole market out there that wants to supply that money, but, but there's no good way to get it to them. Because each home is individual, and no one's going to go out and negotiate with all those individual people. So why don't we you know, set up things called Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and you know, in, interpose lots of- who are, who are they? Who are Freddie? Who so, are those? So th th these are sort of governmental type of entities. They, they, were, they were independent. Hey, Tom, could you speak into the mic a little bit? Because we can't hear you back here. Oh, oh here. Don't sorry about that. Um, so, so there were governmental types of entities, quasi-governmental, private companies now taken back over by the government, um, that, that were interposed for the reason you know, of getting money from the markets to, to individual homeowners. And they would do it by way of creating all these complicated instruments that we've just heard about. And then you say, well, who are these markets that want to buy it? Well, they're, they're investment banks and, and other entities who say, well, we, we need to buy assets. We need assets that are going to give us a return. We need a different source of asset class. You know, especially in the past six, seven years, we saw stock markets downturn in 2001. We saw low interest rates. People needed to be able to get alpha, be able to get return. And so they said, well, there's this great new asset class, or maybe not so new, but, 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 but very broad and robust. And we can rate it for you. We can tell you that it's going to be safe. Never mind that the risks. We want you to put it right up to your. Uh, ne never mind that the risks are sort of different than, um, than what you're used to. We can rate it for this AAA or you know, AA or some, some high quality, whatever you want. And, um, and then banks began to buy. They began to say, OK, that's good. So now, now we've got the, the, the homeowners who need the money getting it and building their homes. We've got the banks and, and whoever else is buying the assets who need high quality assets, and they're getting them. And, and everybody should be happy. But of course, the problem is that there's all this disconnect that Ken talked about. There are several levels. But what about the investment banks? What about the, the Bear Stearns and the Laymans? How do they get? Are they the banks you're talking about? Or are you talking about commercial banks? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I think mainly uh, what we're mainly worried about talking about right now is is the investment banks. Um, well, didn't they didn't they create these special purpose vehicles? Didn't weren't they the ones that did that? Sure, investment banks were, um, were often issuers. They would uh, buy mortgages from various originators and then, and then sell these securities based on the mortgages. That they, they would create the package and then they were marketing them to their, to their institutional customers. And do they keep some? Yes, they, sometimes they kept them voluntarily. Other times, more recently, they were unable always to sell everything that they had packaged, so they would keep some of them uh, of necessity on their own books because there wasn't always a buyer. As long as you're talking, what about the rating agencies? Did they re did they rely upon the rating agencies, the, uh, the investment banks? I think I think every well the rating the, the investment banks were certainly dependent upon the rating agency in order to be able to market the because as has been described, if somebody like a pension fund is only able to buy let's say triple A rated securities, they need to have the the imprimatur of the rating agency that it's triple A. So the investment bank was dependent upon finding a rating agency that would give the right rating in order for the, uh, uh, the upper level tranches in particular to be marketable. So now, Tom, at the end of this process, who owns all these, uh, all these things? <laughs> so it's, it's a wide combination. To the extent that banks have retained mortgages that, that, that they've created, retained interest in these securities, then they're at risk. To the extent they pass them on, then the ultimate holders are at risk. And it's it, it really right, widespread throughout. Could be hedge funds? Absolutely could be hedge funds. To, to those who are skeptical, by the way, it should be noted that it's the issuer who pays the rating agency to do the rating. It's not the buyers. It's not anybody independent. It's the people who are trying to market the instruments who pay the rating agencies for the rating. OK. Now we have these, uh, uh, we have these instruments out there. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, the, uh, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, uh, the, the uh, organization that, that gives you accounting standards, uh, adopted a new standard uh, for what's called mark-to-market accounting. Uh, mark-to-market accounting is required for, with regard to financial instruments that are held for sale, which was practically all of these instruments held by these investment banks and the ultimate purchasers. They did not buy these collateralized debt ob obligations, which represented a pool of home mortgages for the purpose of waiting 20 years until the mortgages were paid off. They put them on their books to sell them. So the uh, FASB said, uh, you must mark to market these assets. Uh, and they came out with a new uh, accounting proposal, uh, a rule, Rule 157, which essentially uh, uh, imposed mark to market or fair value accounting. And they said, here's how you do it. If there's a, if there's a market for the securities, use the market. Uh, if there's a comparable market, if there's no market and there's a comparable market, Use the comparable market, uh, something like that. If, uh, 
if, 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 there's, if there's no market for, for, uh, for Honda, see what Toyota's selling for, or the cars, but something like that. But it turned out that these uh, instruments were so complicated uh, a, a, as suspicions began to arise as to whether or not they could be sold back and forth, uh, that, that there were, were no markets. And in any event, these are not these are not the kind of markets we're usually talking about. You're, are not, you're not selling these on the New York Stock Exchange or the American Stock Exchange. The, they're, they're held on books of people that aren't trading them every day. Yeah, not, not necessarily. I mean, so, so talking about the price for one of these things, not necessarily a coherent That's, thing to do. So the third, then you go to what's called level three. And in level three, uh, you, you have to make up your, your, own, uh, uh, your own scheme for valuing these things. And the problem with level three, as far as all these banks were concerned, uh, was that level three said, you have to have a formula for, for, for valuing all of this, but the formula has to be based upon what you can sell this security in the market for today. Well, now, if there is no market, uh, then uh, it's very difficult for anyone to say that there's much value uh, in these instruments. So as a result, uh, when, the, when the confidence in the market began to disappear and people weren't buying them, these instruments had to be written down on the books of practically all these large investment banks and many of the commercial banks and the hedge funds. Uh, and uh, that kind of led us uh, to this credit crisis. Al, are you going to talk a little bit right. about that? When, when, the, when the housing market turned down and people were unable to pay off on their mortgages, or perhaps some of these people were dubious credit risks in the first place, you then had the, the decline in the value of these instruments. And as David has described, uh, in, in doing their financial statements, these entities, public entities like Merrill Lynch, Bear Stearns, and the like, would have to write down in compliance with uh, FASB 157, write down these instruments to their fair value. So they were reporting, as you may recall, this started about, I don't know, a year, 15 months ago, enormous losses. Uh, now, these may be, in a sense, paper losses, but they are nevertheless losses. Many of these institutions would borrow very heavily in order to engage in these kinds of transactions to buy these securities, maybe borrowing as much as $30 for every dollar of capital. Well, if you're going to write down your assets, you're going to be ending, that's going to be a charge to your capital. So you, your borrowing base has to shrink, or you have to find new capital, or find a new borrower to, re, to, to, to lend, you, lend you more money if your existing borrower pulls the, the credit line out from under you uh, because you've, you're financing these assets. That led to, a, to a, a concern, first of all, that we hadn't heard all the bad news, and we now know that indeed we hadn't heard all the bad news. There were more write-downs to come. Uh, people became fearful in that regard. Prices, prices declined. Uh, that would have a spiraling downward effect, uh, causing the assets to, to further, further decline in value. And as these institutions were searching for capital uh, and unable to get it, uh, creditors became very wary of lending to them or lending to anybody who had these kinds of assets on their books uh, because they were never sure that the person they were lending to really had as much capital as they were representing they had. And the, the Bear Stearns uh, uh, situation was a good, uh, a good example of that. And what happened was that Bear Stearns was highly leveraged uh, it had, a, it had a, some hedge funds that were highly leveraged in this 30 to 1 ratio. Uh, and when these assets began to be written down, uh, people began to say, well, maybe Bear Stearns is, going, is, is not, going to go, not going to be in business. And therefore, I'm not going to, I'm not going to deal with Bear Stearns. I, I'm not going to sell to them. I'm not going to be the party to their contracts. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take my money away from Bear Stearns. Would you? But, can you yeah. describe a little bit more about that, what, how the, the attitude is about uh, on Wall Street this week? A a absolutely. I mean, cer certainly when, when they see something fundamentally at risk inside the assets of a bank or anything else, they're going to get very nervous and decide, well, may maybe I shouldn't be putting my money there. And it, in fact, it can even spread more broadly. I mean, uh, sort of, uh, we'll, we'll get to contagion later, but, it, but it's a funny thing. When people begin to get worried about credit and get worried about confidence I I in returns, um, it will affect seemingly disparate asset classes. I mean, um, they'll, they'll begin to take their money out of, out of um, banks like Bear Stearns, but they'll also begin to take their money out of other places. And, and that begins to worry us about credit default swaps. And, 
Uh, uh, we'll just talk about it a little bit later, but yeah. yeah. But Al, Al, what about the Fed and liquidity? How well, does that I think, all work I think in the, the, yeah, the problem was if, 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 if you can't find, if a bank can find somebody to loan it money, and it may seem unusual uh, to people, but banks borrow from each other. Banks have credit lines with each other. Uh, that's how they fund, fund money. Sometimes it's just overnight lending. Uh, we have repurchase agreements or simply simple overnight one day or short term facilities. Well, as people became concerned whether the guy on the other side of that arrangement might not be so solid and might not be so secure, they would pull their financing line, leaving uh, these banks with the only recourse being access to the Fed. Now, the Fed uh, has a fairly limited range to which they would typically borrow, lend their money. But in, as this crisis emerged, the Fed broadened the scope of those who could come to the so-called Fed window, namely some of these investment banks, to borrow from the Fed because they didn't have other sources of cash, other sources of liquidity. Uh, this has now spread even further where, as I say, banks unwilling to, loan to lend to each other, as we've seen some banks fail, uh, that causes this contagion effect that's been referred to. And what we're now seeing that I think is really brought to the what we're hearing on the floor of, of Congress these days about Main Street is that ordinary businesses are dependent upon the ability to borrow money on a short-term basis, just to finance a payroll, this week's payroll. They're waiting for their customers to pay them. They don't have the cash, so they borrow on a short-term basis from their bank. If their bank is not willing to lend to them because banks just become worried about where the economy is headed, uh, generally, as this has spread wider and wider, uh, the ability to, to borrow those amounts has, is, is drying up or the cost of borrowing has gone up. And one of the most dramatic things that we saw about a week or two ago was that uh, people who've invested their money in money market funds are now worried about the safety and soundness of those. Now, we know that bank deposits are insured up to $100,000 currently by the FDIC. Money market funds are not insured, but everybody's always been under the impression that it's, it's a dollar. You know, you may not earn a whole lot of interest on it, but it's a dollar. Uh, it's a stable value because those money market funds invest in short-term debt obligations. Well, as some of those debt obligations defaulted, including Lehman, including Lehman, uh, big big amount, Lehman would borrow money on a short-term basis to finance its operations. When it went bankrupt, those, those obligations were, were in default. And there was one money market fund that went as low as 97 cents on the dollar. You're not supposed to go below about 99.5. And uh, if, you, if you're worried about your money market fund, you take your money out of the money market fund right. and you put it into treasury bonds. Treasury bonds, so that, that source of liquidity of the money markets buying debt from companies is gone. And now, the, 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 uh, the, the, the Fed has come in and used an old facility, a statutory power from the Depression, to actually provide insurance to money market funds. This is only a short-term fix. It's not a long-term arrangement. The money market funds have to pay an insurance premium for it, so that slightly reduces the return on the money market. But the idea that, that we have lost the safety of the money markets we saw Northern Trust the other day put up, I don't know, between 300 and 500 million dollars. It's agreed to provide if needed for some of its money market funds. It had exposure to Lehman. Lehman was an enormous organization, borrowed money all over the place, and this has a ripple effect that has helped, uh, contributed to this impact of drying up credit. Tom, you want to talk a little bit more about Freddie and Fannie? What did the, what, what did the government do for them and why? Sure. So Freddie and Fannie, like we've talked about before, um, you know, the, these mortgages may have been retained um, uh, or they may have been passed on. So Fannie and Freddie were these giant entities responsible for pooling together residential mortgages and then passing an off lot through to other ultimate buyers, but they also retained some themselves. So when housing values began to go down and subprime mortgages in particular began to lose value, Fannie and Freddie were sitting on a lot of mortgage exposure that, that um, was losing value. And they also had problems with the, the, the credit that they had mm -hmm. guaranteed that mortgages that they had passed on. They were borrowers as well, were they not? Absolutely. Huge I, borrowers in the market. They, they were sitting on an awful lot of mortgages themselves. In, indeed, their mortgages, their, their uh, debt was worldwide, spread worldwide to foreign governments and, and sovereign wealth funds. And, Absolutely. 
in, in enormous amounts. Yeah, and, so I, and I think while we've talked largely, and much of this was caused, has been caused by the subprime lending or the intermediate level, the so-called Alt-A, I think another potential shoe to drop, which is probably why Congress has moved to, to act here, is because uh, in addition to packaging mortgages into these asset-backed securities that Ken described, we've got the uh, credit card receivables are done the same way, that credit card companies uh, take the bill that you owe them and they sell that. They package it and they sell that receivable to get in more money so they can conduct their business, the constant in and out flow of funds. And so a lot of uh, other classes of asset-backed securities, like credit card receivables, and are out there. And car loans and student loans also. There's That's right. About every class of financial asset you can think of is securitized. And as people uh, experience difficulty making the payments on those obligations, then those asset classes will also be in peril in the same way that we've seen the mortgage-backed securities go. Okay, Ken, you want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, about credit default swaps? Not in not in a very complicated way. Very simple. Well, I think the, 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 oh, Tom, do you, Tom? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You got the one. You sure. got the one. Sorry. Uh, do we have the slides? Or yeah, if if you could forward to the first credit default slide. So, um, for a slight sideline, it wasn't all just mortgages that were going on. Um, you, you heard about the AIG problems, and and a lot of what their problems were were, were these credit default swaps, and. and a credit default swap sounds like a nice thing, just like th this whole mortgage process sounds like a nice thing until you understand all the risks. So, so in a, a credit default swap, you've got some sort of risky bond. You, you've got a credit default swap that somebody like AIG sells you, and then you put them together, and all the risk in your bond goes away. It sounds like a wonderful product. It's insurance on your bond. If you could forward to the next slide. Um, so, so normally you pay principal on a bond, you pay a bunch of coupons on the bond, and then you get the, or you get paid a bunch of coupons on the bond, and then you get the principal back at the end. And there's risk in all those red bars. If you could forward to the next slide, you could buy um, an insurance on the bond that says, well, you'll pay a premium regularly to AIG or whoever it might be that's selling you the credit default swap. And then in the case that the bond defaults, that the person you got the bond from isn't able to pay it back, then you'll get the, the money from your insurer. And so if you could go to the next slide. Now you're in a situation where you've combined things so that you don't have any credit risk anymore. The company's not going to, to fail to pay you because the insurer is going to step in. Well, you've still got counterparty risk in case a big company like IAG falls apart, but we don't have to worry about that, right? So if you could go to the last slide. So the problem is pricing these things. And AIG figures they're a big insurance company that know all about insurance risks, but they hadn't really done these credit default swaps before. So, so you've got a difficulty. They, they, they have to understand exactly what the probabilities are that these defaults are going to happen. And it gets worse because it's not the probability on any one bond. It's also you have all these interlinkages among bonds. When, when things go bad in the market, and they, it's often said correlations go to one, uh, all, all companies begin to go bad together and bonds begin to default together. And so all of a sudden, AIG was sitting on an awful lot of credit default swaps that, that they had just kept and not passed on to anyone else. And, and, and this exposure began to blow them up at the same time as all of this mortgage. mortgage. I, think, I think also in terms of, of sources of funds, uh, one, one additional point to make. We saw early on when some of these investment banks ran into trouble, they went overseas to the so-called sovereign wealth funds to, to get capital, very substantial amounts of capital were put in. In some cases, hedge funds put in money. That has dried up. They're standing on the sidelines because of the risk. And if you saw in the, I think it was in the WAMU situation, where a hedge fund had come in to help bail out, if you will, WAMU, putting in, I think it was about $7 billion in the, uh, for equity, buying stock in the company. Um, and that's now basically been wiped out by, by, the, by the, uh, the, the buyout of WAMU. And so the hedge funds, which have enormous, or enormous amounts of capital in their hands, as well as the sovereign wealth funds, who were in there early on to try to resuscitate some of these entities or prop them up, they're now on the sidelines. So those, those uh, I don't know how many zeros it would take to describe them, but in, in, in the you know, hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars that are available in theory out there just are not being uh, invested in these entities because of the concern about the risk profile that oh, they have. Okay, Ken, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Bernanke and, and Paulson went before a group of Congress, con congressional leaders and told them about what was going to happen. Uh, could, you, could you kind of invent what they said, what's wrong with the, how the markets are freezing up and how this is going to affect 
the man on the street and the, and the financial structure and the whole world? Yeah, that's, it's a very important part of the story because one of the things that um, you might be wondering is why is uh, the government stepping in and making these rescue loans like we did? We made an $85 billion loan uh, to AIG. Why was that necessary? And um, it's really not about AIG at all. It's really about the effect that a, f that a bankruptcy of AIG would have on the counterparties that have contracts with AIG, like Alan described and like uh, Tom described. In the case of Lehman Brothers, uh, the government didn't make a rescue loan, and Lehman Brothers filed for Chapter 11. Uh, as Alan said, they, Lehman had been doing a lot of borrowing in short-term uh, commercial paper markets. Uh, short-term debt is usually considered to be very safe because, you know, if things start to go wrong, you can just, you know, cut off money. But if you do it too late, next thing you know, you're an unsecured creditor in a bankruptcy, and your recovery is not going to be all that much. So uh, Lehman's counterparties, uh, people who had invested in this short-term debt, uh, are now holding securities that are worth much less than what they thought. It was money market funds that were holding a lot of this paper. Uh, and as Alan said, right, when these money market funds had to take losses, um, investors started in these money market funds started realizing, oh, gosh, you know, um, I thought I had something that was safe. Now all of a sudden it looks risky. And money market funds that even didn't hold uh, Lehman Brothers paper Investors started to get spooked in that and run the bank in, in those money market funds as well. I think it was so what a, a Putnam $12 billion fund just decided to close because they were afraid there would be a run on the fund. So, so that, that's the whole idea of contagion, is the, the government has a very difficult um, problem to, to try to solve. Uh, in AIG, the issue was these, uh, were these credit default swaps, that AIG had sold a lot of uh, insurance protection to counterparties, hedge funds, other banks. Uh, we don't really know who was on the other side of these transactions. That's one of the, the problems. Uh, but the idea was these counterparties thought they had bought insurance from someone who would pay them in the event of a, of a default by GM or in mortgage-backed securities or something else. And now all of a sudden, they don't have the insurance anymore. They've got to go out and buy it from someone else. That drives up the cost of the insurance. So that's how these spillover effects uh, work. And so it's not really just about the firm that's failing. It's about the effect on all these counterparties. And we're starting to see some of these uh, spillover effects in, um, in the corporate sector. Uh, the, I took a quick look at uh, CFO.com. They took a survey of uh, chief financial officers who have to think about, how do I keep my company from going bankrupt? Uh, and in their survey of, of chief financial officers, they said 36% are reducing their capital spending. All right, we, we had a, a significant effect on the economy. 41% of them are moving all of their short-term investments out of things like commercial paper and into things that are government insured, like treasuries, like bank deposits. Um, so that's the whole idea of contagion, and, and that's what makes uh, the, the government's uh, role in this thing well, uh, very difficult. I regard it as even worse than contagion. There's a tremendous amount of fear, that is, that, that, that the counterparties, the borrowers, uh, are, 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 and the lenders are, are, are all fearful, and the lenders don't want to lend to anyone they think may become insolvent. So we're finding that the banks aren't lending to each other, so the, the banks aren't lending to, to small businesses, uh, and there's this tremendous uncertainty in the system, and there's really a danger of a universal run on the bank in the whole system. And that's kind of what I think Secretary Paulson was telling uh, to Congress, that if you don't do something, this system is going to freeze up, and it's going to freeze our economy and the world economy, so you'd better do some, something. So what happens? They decide, uh, Secretary Paulson brings a, brings a proposal to Congress and said, that what we need to do is to put liquidity in the system, and the way they'll we'll do that is to buy up these collateralized debt obligations. We're going to go uh, to, to the whole market and, and, and pay $700 billion for this junk that was sold throughout the economy, uh, and we're going to put onto your books uh, good assets, and the government's going to own these assets and, and sell them at a later time. And of course, Congress said, that's ridiculous. And then Paulson said, no, it's not. The, the market's going to freeze if you don't do that. And furthermore, uh, he, he said, I think he should have said, we're going to buy them at a price which will allow us to sell them at a profit at some time once they're all, uh, all unwound. And I think there was a lot of skepticism about that. So finally, 
uh, Secretary Paulson, who's not a politician, even though he is a, in political life, came to Congress and, and failed to pre-sell the deal. And when the House got to vote on the bill, uh, many of the House members said, not on your life. This is a bailout of Wall Street. Uh, in my view, it was not a bailout of Wall although it was a bailout of Los Wall Street. The, the, the problem was not that Wall Street was failing, but that the whole country might seize up and there wouldn't be any credit available for anybody in the society. Uh, and uh, 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 the markets were, were expecting the House to pass this bill, and when the House didn't pass it last Monday, you saw the market go down over 700 points, and on Tuesday, the market went up in expectation of the bill that's now before the Senate. Uh, and the Senate has passed, passed it last night, didn't right, they? Yeah. Right, yeah. And it's now going to go to the House with a lot of other goodies in it that were necessary in order to get the bill passed. But nevertheless, I think we're looking forward uh, to the passing of a bill to some greater certainty in the markets. And my own opinion is uh, if, if that bill doesn't pass, we're going to see our stock markets go down a tremendous amount more, and we're going to see a lot of flurry in our financial markets worldwide that are just... Uh, David, do you, do you think that Christmas tree that they passed last night will improve the chances uh, in the House or dampen the chances in the House? I mean, uh, I was reading a list of what's on that bill. It's, it, it's, it's like everything that was left unattended to at the end of the senatorial session, they just put on the bill. Right, yes. Uh, uh, I, 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 I told my seminar, we had a little talk in my seminar about this, and I said, Do the, did the congressman get elected in order to get reelected next term, or were they elected in order to use their best judgment about how to s save the country? My you class voted in favor of the last one, I'll tell you. And <laughs> I spent enough time in Washington <laughs> to know what the real answer is. The real answer is a proper re-election, but, I, but uh, I think that, uh, uh, that there's been an, uh, enough backlash from people complaining about how their pension fund assets have gone down that some of these congressmen may, may realize they, they might not get re-elected if they vote against it. Yeah, the, the, number that I, the number that I heard after Monday was that something like 401ks and the like went down of in that market decline, about $850 billion. And the people were, were, have a tendency to look at their funds at the end of the quarter, September 30th, they'd be very disappointed to see what's happened to their nest egg. Well, uh, that's the end, end of our uh, panel. We would take uh, any questions that you have. There's a microphone circulating out John, there. John here has a microphone, so everybody can hear you. Just wait till you run. He's gonna run over mm -hmm. to you if you have. I know that the, I think at least the first years have a class starting at two. So uh, we understand it, but we'll, we'll continue on beyond that for the people who can stay, so. I want to ask what uh, I think is the House of Republicans question. Okay, there's all this bad paper out there. Nobody knows what these investments are worth. Banks won't lend to e each other. We're all invested in this rotten stuff. We gotta take our loans. Let's take them. Um, all the, I mean, what's the worst that can happen? All the banks, all the commercial banks that are invested must go out of the We uh, we uh, pay off, uh, uh, we, we wipe out the, the shareholders, we pay off the creditors to the extent we can. And if there is a demand for banking services, the market will provide it. It's not hard to establish a bank, all you need is money. There's a lot of money out there. I mean, none of us are making money in the stock market. We'll invest in some, something that promises a, a six, seven percent Turn six months from now, we'll have all these new banks lending money whenever money, whenever the market requires. Well, your commercial deposits are going to, unless you're willing to invest in the equity, the commercial deposits pay, you know, a percent or less. That's not where people want to put their money. But it would seem to me that if you let everything essentially crumble, uh, I think you'll have outright panic. It seems to me. I mean, if, if you li literally let everything at risk of failing fail. Uh, I, I don't know what the consequences would be. I, I mean, it seems like one of the huge concerns against that, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right in principle, like the market should work and that, that should be fine. But, but the big concern is that something catastrophic will happen that's sort of irrevocable, or irrevocable for a long time. Like if the credit markets don't loosen up a little bit and if people aren't able to meet their payrolls because they're not able to get the short-term loans that they want, then people won't get paid then people won't be able to pay their rent, people won't be able to pay their mortgages, and, and we'll have a catastrophe that you can sort of undo, but over many years, rather than in the short term. 
that's the fear. Now, whether that's a legitimate fear or not is, is a reasonable question that we can discuss. But. but who's going to take that risk is really the question that we have to ask. <laughs> well, that's the question that the, 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 the no votes in the House raised. Other questions here? Uh, my question is about student loans, since I understand that student loans are funded in much the same way through an auction process like the commercial paper market. Um, so, you know, do you think that, that if this number goes through and sort of works as we hope and expect it will, that, you know, we won't have problems getting student loans next semester, next year, the year after that? You know, do, you, do you really see that helping, helping the market in that way? Student loans were not in the same category as the uh, structured debt obligations for home loans, and there hasn't been the default rate, rate underneath them, so, so, there's, so they, they haven't reached the level of, uh, of concern that there are with those other markets. But if this market craters and there's no, there's no credit, the student loans will be right up there uh, with the other loans, so you should vote in favor of the bailout bill. <laughs> That's a, a great question that you ask because um, some, uh, this proposal that uh, looks like it will go through is not uh, the only one that's been proposed and uh, a lot of economists are proposing that, um, really arguing that the main problem is not necessarily that mortgages are illiquid. Uh, the main problem is that uh, bank balance sheets are in trouble, that banks have too much debt and not enough equity and that's why they're not making loans. And so why don't we just address that problem directly uh, by injecting somehow equity capital uh, into the banks. Uh, so that's an alternative proposal that doesn't require uh, buying these illiquid assets. And, and there are a variety of ways that that, that can be done. Uh, Charles Calamiris has uh, one proposal. Raghu Rajan has another proposal. And, um, and they're, worth, they're worth taking a look at uh, as, uh, as an alternative. So this is... Uh, a way of potentially enhancing liquidity, uh, but I think we still do have this uh, solvency problem uh, at the banks uh, unless, we, unless we overpay for these mortgages. That's, uh, that's the, my first take on it. The, the, uh, the bill has two provisions in it to, uh, to, to help with foreclosures, assistance to homeowners, and to mitigate against foreclosures. So those are provisions added to the bill. Uh, my mind is we, we need a second stage here, and that is not only solving the liquidity crisis, but trying to get at the home loan uh, question uh, directly. Uh, it's obviously undeniable that we're going through a crisis right now, and it seems like just getting through the crisis is what's on everybody's radar screen right now. But moving forward, what role does corporate governance have into ensuring that there isn't a boom and bailout kind of cyclical cycle? Well, I think there will be a lot of rethinking, uh, or some rethinking, certainly, of the regulatory process. I think one thing that people uh, may not understand, uh, we heard John McCain say, fire Chris Cox of the SEC. When the SEC is regulating broker-dealers, they do not operate the same way as the regulators of the banks. The regulators of the banks are looking at, at safety and soundness, uh, qualitative issues in ways that the SEC really doesn't have the power to do. David can speak to that much, much more authoritatively than I can. But I think that, that is one thing. I would not want to see a reaction the way we had with Sarbanes-Oxley, which I think was a, a cobbled together uh, not fully well thought through bill that still has flaws in it and they're still living with that today trying to, to, to get around some of the more uh, uh, ill-considered provisions. But I think uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of proposals on the table, many of which were made by a blue ribbon group within the last year for a, uh, a, 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 a looking back, taking a step back and looking at 
what our regulatory structure is for the financial markets because we have the commodities markets are regulated by one entity, the securities markets by another, the banks by, by two or three or four regulators, insurance is regulated at the state level, and I think maybe there needs to be some reassessment of that, of that process, uh, irrespective of, of how each individual entity may govern itself. Uh, and uh, you can be sure that that will happen, that there will be a look at it. You can also be sure that every player in the, uh, in the apparatus uh, will, will be trying to lobby for, the, for their own self-benefit. Okay, um, I just have a quick question about, um, so part of the, part of the bailout um, included raising the status quo limit on the national debt. So my basic question is, where is the $700 billion really coming from, and, and what does it do to the credibility of the United States for this country? Any of our economists want to answer that? <laughs> By Treasury I, I, I think you're, you, you know, you're right to raise the, the point that um, this $700 billion isn't uh, coming from nowhere. You don't hear people saying that the U.S. government, as a result, is increasingly likely to default. I, I don't think anybody's suggesting that at this stage. But um, could this have adverse effects on the, on the economy if it turns out that we buy these, uh, buy these assets, sell them at a substantial loss, and we have to either uh, uh, raise taxes to, in order to, uh, to cover the deficit or, uh, or deal with inflation? You know, there's, uh, it's, if we do wind up losing money on this deal, it will have some effects on the economy that I think people haven't really thought through. Before. Well, what, what is the effect of the Treasury's need for, you know, give or take $700 billion to borrow? What, what in terms of, that, that's, as you say, the most, deemed to be the most safe security that you can get. What does that do in terms of the access of, of other, P, other entities that need, need funds, need, need to borrow funds from the ability from them, for them to raise those funds? Well, I, I think what we've seen recently, I mean, I'm dodging the question maybe, but what I think what we've seen recently is the reverse of that. Uh, you know, an extreme flight to quality where treasury yields are, if you want to say, too low uh, rather than too high as a result of default risk that comes from increased obligations. So I, I don't know if that's the first order issue at this well, point. Well, essentially what you're going to have is, uh, is, the, is the inflationary pressure because of the printing of more money, and that, has, that is, will have problems for the economy. Yeah. So this is all so far based just on residential mortgages going bad. Um, commercial real estate is on the verge of, of going away. Residential real estate has. You've already mentioned credit cards, which are, again, on the verge, student loans. What's your opinion about whether or not $700 billion is even remotely possibly enough? That's a judgment that that's a judgment the Treasury Secretary has made. I, I read something in, in Forbes.com yesterday where somebody at the Treasury was asked where did that number come from, and the un, unnamed person said we were looking for a really big number. <laughs> I mean, you, if, if they're right about the about the credit problems here, uh, buying these buying these assets is not an evidence of the of the assets at risk but an evidence that they can have liquidity. Once there's liquidity, then the, then the market, for the loaning for commercial purposes may increase. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's the hope. I mean, that, that hopefully the 700 billion is not exactly gonna fix every problem in the world, but it will allow, hopefully, private markets to begin to work, work again, and, and private money to find its way in rather than federal money. Now, whether 700 billion is remotely enough even to get things started liquidity-wise, uh, hopefully it is, but, but it's, it's a fair question. <laughs> Uh, I'm curious about um, the long-term implications of government intervention now. Um, just in the long run, what, I mean, how, like how are the actions now going to resonate in the long run simply because I think one of the fundamental principles is that this is a capitalist society and it seems that now everybody's kind of running, running away from anything that doesn't, that doesn't include the government. You know, so how do we, how do we take the actions now and kind of balance that with avoiding a socialist economy? I mean, it, it's, it's a serious problem, and it's a serious problem what it does to set expectations. Like, if everyone starts up whatever the new investment banking system is, understanding that there's an implicit put that no matter how badly they do, the government's going to come in and fix things, th then they're going to take a lot more risks. Um, so, so, I mean, uh, aside from, you know, whether it's socialism or not, you know, you know it's, it's going to radically change how people act in the future. 
and, and, and we have to be very careful about the expectations that we're setting up and, and how we're going to make people behave. Now, oh, you, you hear oh, word, go ahead. Uh, you hear the word moral hazard a lot, and uh, that's something to keep your eye on. The, um, for example, if, uh, if we're worried about, uh, so when these gov the government has made these rescue loans, uh, often shareholders have been punished. Uh, that's part of the attempt to sort of cure the moral hazard problem that has punished the shareholders who put their money into these, uh, into these risky ventures. Um, but that hasn't been done with creditors. And so one of the things to, you know, uh, to see how it, how it plays out is it, if it turns out that parties are aware that governments will step in, in particular to prevent short-term money markets from collapsing, um, then what does that lead to? It leads to a situation where lenders are going to be aware that short-term loans are the ones that are the most likely to be secure, and we may see companies relying more on short-term borrowing in the future, which may not be uh, a good thing. Uh, so I, I don't want to crit you know, criticize these rescue loans too much, but we should at least understand that there's a trade-off that goes in that direction. Punishing shareholders is one thing, but uh, making sure that creditors stay whole in order to prevent these systematic risks has these moral hazard implications as well. Uh, I have a question for you. I've been trying to understand uh, exactly what went wrong. And there's a number of different storylines, some of which uh, you've suggested today. Uh, one of them is the failure to uh, really have effective oversight on uh, Freddie and Fannie, uh, and maybe that they were protected by particular uh, politicians. Another is the extraordinary slicing and dicing uh, of the mortgage-backed securities. And the third, of course, is The, the, uh, my, my view is that the, the credit crisis cannot be blamed on any regulator uh, or on anybody in particular. Uh, we had these, these collateralized debt obligations out there which were extremely risky and nobody predicted the, cat the catastrophe of the, of the home loan market going down. And when you ask who didn't predict it, the investment banks didn't predict it, the, the commercial banks didn't can, didn't do it, the rating agencies didn't, the Treasury didn't, the Fed didn't, and the SEC didn't. Nobody seemed to have in mind the possibility that this mar uh, market might collapse, except PIMCO. <laughs> PIMCO was a big hedge fund that thought it was coming. Uh, but uh, it's very hard to say the regulatory system was bad when even the parties that stood to lose tremendous amounts of money uh, 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 couldn't, couldn't see this coming. I, I, I agree completely with that. I mean, it, you know, who, who was going to see the housing market fall like it did? But um, at, at the same time, I mean, the lack of transparency in these instruments makes it very difficult to assess what the risks are. I mean, we're, we're used to all the time thinking about, you know, the difficulty in shareholders having corporate governance stand in between them and their assets and all the problems that are caused. Here we're interposing many, many layers between the underlying asset and the people who are investing it. And maybe they're not as complicated as corporate governors, but, but I mean, slicing and dicing is going on in such a way that I really think a lot of the ultimate holders didn't understand fully the risks that they were getting into. And maybe there's no way through regulation to make something that complicated clear to, to the people who ultimately buy it. But, but, I mean, it seems to be a difficulty. Th these are very, I mean, I, I've read some of these private placement memos for these asset-backed securities, and I am not, don't have the, the economic background that people on my right and left have here, but they are extremely complex instruments. And uh, if all these investment bankers and pension funds and others who bought them understood them, then that's fine, but they are very uh, expensive and are very, very uh, complex. And I think the whole housing market issue in terms of the point that was made at the very outset, uh, lending, lending money uh, where, where the people who made the lending decisions laid off all of the risk, not part of the risk, but all of the risk, the mortgage originators, and giving loans to people at 100% of the equity of the home, uh, not requiring people to make any down payment whatsoever, those kinds of things set up, whether it's a perfect storm or what, it certainly increased the riskiness by, by eliminating some of, the, uh, some, some of the risk in the people who were involved in the process and letting people who were certainly encouraged to buy homes, and it's a wonderful thing to do, but put them in, this, in a place where their margin of error was very small if that two wage earner couple becomes a one wage earner couple and that sort of thing. 
I, I think some of this, this perfect storm thing, um, there's some risk, I think, that we throw the baby out with the bathwater and blame the whole thing on securitization and say this is just a terrible idea, we should uh, forget about the whole thing. Um, a lot of the uh, particularly poor results as far as the credit rating, credit rating agencies go with the ability to predict defaults um, took place in subprime where, you know, mathematical models that predicted how likely defaults were going to be were based on a very short recent history. And that recent history was during a period when housing prices were running up and so defaults were very low. And so ratings that were based on that history, which obviously didn't apply uh, to the current period, generated a lot of these sort of unforeseen. But how, how do you, don't them. you build in a confidence factor? If you know that you have limited history and the like, when you're doing that model, doesn't that impact what level of confidence you have and therefore what a non-economist like myself would call fudge factor you would put in there in doing that evaluation? Well, the, um, it's, that's, you know, it's a reasonable point. I mean, we, um, historically, there is a correlation between the ratings that the rating agencies assign to things and the probabilities that they subsequently default. So it's not as if the rating agencies' models were complete rubbish and didn't predict default at all. They did. Um, but I think, you know, there is an argument to be made that this was a different environment with a different product, with a shorter history, and maybe investors should have been more skeptical, or rating agencies should have been more skeptical about, um, about assigning very high quality ratings to securities that were riskier than they may seem. And, and speaking from the perspective of somebody who does litigation, if the fault lay at the rating agency level in terms of sloppiness, uh, poor models, uh, selling their rating to the highest bidder, so to speak, um, they're not a very good target for a lawsuit. They don't, they're, they're, they're very thinly capitalized, if at all. There are certain issues regarding the ability to sue them under the First Amendment. So they're probably the least vulnerable from a litigation point of view, yet they're the ones that people tend to look to as a quasi or believe to be independent evaluation of the creditworthiness of these, of these various tranches. One, one last comment here? No. <laughs> no, you know. Well, thank you all for for coming. Uh, we are available for some questions afterwards.